this is the panel about scale up. This is the panel about how are we going to make this stuff. Um, and we've got this gigantic scale up challenge. Um, you know, when a number of us were involved in early days at RPE, we would just assume that venture was going to venture capital was going to carry the load. Um, that that would be the implementation process. So get across the valley of death. Venture would scale this stuff up. Um, it turned out to be a much more complicated story, as everybody in this room, I think, understands. So of the implementation funding that we were spending each year on clean energy technology implementation, just a very small portion of that is from the venture capital sector. Venture is really focused on software and biotech. Venture has got a five-year time horizon, maybe seven. Energy technologies, hard tech in general, that's 10 plus years. Venture just can't manage that longer term risk. So we are being out invested by about three to one in new technology implementation and energy by China, but we are still developing the leading new technologies. But if venture is walked, how will the US, how will the new emerging clean technology companies scale up and move into production? And we've got some very deep problems here. The US thinks that innovation is all about R&D. That's very short-sighted. R&D is only the beginning part of the story. Innovation includes the scale-up story. You've got to get to the advanced prototype, the demonstration, the testing, the production, the design, the initial, initial manufacturing stages. Because we haven't mastered this, we've got deep problems. We tend to settle on dominant technologies. We tend to lock those technologies in. But in energy, where we've got a 40-year challenge that we've got to get out ahead of, technology lock-in doesn't work well, and we tend to strand our new innovative technologies. We've got a stranded innovation problem. Overall, we are facing, after we get through the valley of death, we've got the mountain of death. You can see the valley, but then we've got to scale that thing. The panel with us today, each of them represents companies that have managed this scale up. They are on their way. And they have lessons for us on this scale up process, on this manufacturing process, that I think are going to be very useful, particularly to the emerging co companies that are in the audience. So leading off is going to be Sela Nanotechnologies, a High energy, high energy density lithium ion battery anode process using nanostructured silicon composites to greatly grow um, energy density and avoid, at the same time, silicon cracking problems. So Gene Bertaszewski is co-founder and CEO of Sela. He's going to lead us into the model that they've followed. Um, Lila Madrone is, is going to talk about her company, Sunfolding. It's a solar tracking technology that uses pneumatic actuaries. So no motors, no gearboxes. It's mass manufactured. It's a modular approach uh, to, that can boost solar reliability, really cut maintenance and operating costs, which are now key to scaling up solar. And then uh, David Crompton of Acades Power is going to speak to us. He's CEO. They have a fascinating opposed piston internal combustion engine approach dramatically increases fuel efficiency, reduces CO2 emissions. It's got a power pack that doubles the power pack, uh, much lower cost and lower complexity. So very interesting companies that are well on their way in the scale-up process with lessons, I think, that will be important to all of us. So, Gene. Thanks, Bill. Great. So just to give you guys a little bit of an introduction on uh, what we do. Let's see if it's there slides? Where are my slides? Well, while they figure out the slides, I'll tell you what we do. Um, 
So we make uh, next generation battery material. Uh, where we sit in the marketplace is that material gets shipped to our uh, customers who are the battery makers. They integrate it into existing lithium ion factories. And those factories produce uh, a product, a battery, that is much higher energy density. And that higher energy density allows uh, consumer devices to add features. That higher energy density allows electric vehicles to go further. And most importantly, it allows electric vehicles to lower the cost of, um, of their battery, which is the most expensive part of, uh, of the car, of course. And, uh, and so, no slides. Um, so I think the, the key thing to think about is, is that the car of the 21st century is really defined by chemistry, sort of all the things that, um, there we go, all the things that you care about in the vehicle you're going to buy next uh, are defined by batteries. And that's range, acceleration, recharge time, and cost. So everything but the fit and finish. So everything will trend towards who has the best chemistry will have the best car. And what's been very clear over the last uh, 20 years is we've reached the limit of existing lithium ion, of intercalation materials. And you can see that in sort of the energy density plot on the right here. And correlated to that, we've stopped lowering the cost of the lowest cost um, uh, batteries that you can buy, the commodity price, which is stabilized today around $150 a kilowatt hour. So we started CELA with the notion of you can move to a new set of materials while using the same battery factories uh, to double energy density and ultimately lower cost uh, by as much as half. As I mentioned, we ship to battery makers. Uh, we can integrate into any factory that builds a lithium ion battery today, which means we can be in any product that uses a lithium ion battery today or tomorrow. Our product, uh, Key features are it drops into the existing factories, and then it's massively scalable. From day one, we sort of only let our scientists use precursors that were globally available in massive quantities, and we mandated that those scientists and engineers used only bulk manufacturing techniques, which have great scaling properties. Uh, RPE has been a huge help along the way. Uh, we've actually gotten three awards over the years in different technologies, but the first one is probably the most important, uh, which came at a time when funding was very scarce and really put us, helped us get to that Series B through that valley of death, if you will. Um, and then since then, we've expanded some research programs into cathode technology as well as electrolyte technology. And those haven't matured yet. So sort of most of the funding, we've raised about $300 million to date, have come on the back of the performance of the anode product. And then as far as our scale up, um, and we've, we've gone about a, up about 100x in scale from our R&D line to our pilot line. We're manufacturing there 24-7 24, 24 today. And we've just completed the construction of our production line, our commercial line, which is another um, 50x scale up from that pilot. Uh, and now we're starting to think about how do we get to multi-gigawatt hours over the next years. And so that'll be the challenge for us uh, and something we'll talk about here today. I'll hand it back over to you now. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Layla? Thank you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Layla Madrone, CTO and founder of Sunfolding. And we're going to wait for the slides. OK, there they go. Uh, so it's unfolding. We say that we're building next generation solar infrastructure. And what we're building is a solar tracker. So solar trackers are the machines that move the panels to follow the sun to make the most energy possible. And nearly all ground mount uh, solar installations in the US use these. They're basically the backbone of solar. Uh, at Sunfolding, we are building a better solar tracker, as you can see here. Here's how it works. As you change the air pressure on either side, you change the position. And what's so exciting about doing it this way is you can replace dozens of components with a single part. By replacing all of these traditional mechanical parts with air, you can make faster, better, easier solar. And a little bit more specifically, um, by getting rid of all of this complexity of the solar plant, we can actually do things like get more capacity out of the same land, increase the efficiency, install solar fields two to three times faster, and drastically reduce the maintenance over the entire lifetime of the plant. And this isn't just about making solar cheaper. It's about making solar far more profitable over the entire lifetime. We've been working on this for about eight years. Um, and we really have been going to scale basically in the last year or so. And the market's showing that it believes in these value propositions. Um, and we're currently executing on a 100 megawatt portfolio all over the US. 
But this really started with ARPA-E. Uh, ARPA-E came in in 2012, and that enabled us to really look at this idea. Could we take advanced, high-volume manufacturing approaches and advanced materials that haven't been used for machines bef before and apply them to create a new kind of machine specifically designed for solar? And this wasn't just about building like a cool little uh, demo that can move panels around. It was about building something that could really last for the 30 years of the harsh solar power plant lifetime. And that work was so successful that we actually got this follow-up award to take it to the real world and do something that is akin, I think, to this pilot program you may have heard about that RPE is doing. And this was to take these ideas we had in the lab and apply it in the field and look at things like how our pneumatic circuitry worked throughout the entire field. Were we actually getting the kind of accuracies we predicted, the kind of performance we predicted? And how does this really install? And what's kind of the experience that the industry would have as they use this? And a little bit about our manufacturing, the actual foundation and driver for everything we were doing from day one was to figure out how to use existing manufacturing infrastructure to build a better machine. So we knew that if we could leverage high volume processes instead of overseas low cost labor, which is how motors and gearboxes are built, we could manufacture in the US for a lower cost than manufacturing abroad. And then we got the benefit of US tier one quality as well as getting things to market faster. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of our manufacturers. So uh, really notably, we've been working with DuPont for years, honing on the most robust materials and manufacturing methods. What we've been using from DuPont has already been used for decades in automotive and marine applications. And so all of these examples you see here have been look pretty similar to what we're doing, and they've already been used in environments as harsh or harsher than a solar power plant. And then there's a plant in Kentucky that's been making air brake tubing used by trucks and trains that are built to rigorous test standards like SAE. So we teamed up with them to make the air delivery system, um, applying all the same kind of uh, know-how and quality standards they've been using to make sure that trucks don't fail. We're using them to make sure that solar plants don't fail. And finally, here's a repurposed automotive factory in Tennessee. We've partnered with one of the fastest growing automotive CMs in North America. So this factory actually used to be empty, and now we, have, now we filled it with workers using automotive know-how and automotive infrastructure to build sun-folding drive systems for solar. So after the last few years, um, after, uh, we've created a network of partnerships throughout the US, leveraging decades-long expertise in automotive, marine, and energy industries. And together with these manufacturing partners, we are helping solar go faster and further. Thanks. Thanks, Layla. Okay. David. This is a right? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Crompton. Uh, I've been with Acadies Power as the president and CEO for about six months now. Been in the powertrain industry for uh, more than 30 years. Um, pleased to be part of the panel and the conversation today, very relevant for what we're trying to accomplish as a company, as a Cades, and I think really important for this industry. I thought I'd take a few minutes and just uh, focus on giving you an overview of who we are, uh, what we do, and why we think it matters. Um, talk a little bit about the projects that we have um, in place right now, and then give you a sense for where we are on the continuum of adoption between the valley, the mountain, and hopefully not death. Perhaps we ought to come up with a, a, a better term for that. Um, uh, in terms of who we are, we're a, we're a small enabling technology company. We're headquartered in San Diego um, with a satellite office in Detroit. Um, we focus on the powertrain industry with uh, particular focus on transportation, um, industrial, and energy sectors. Uh, it's a fundamentally different um, engine architecture uh, focused on thermal management, uh, pumping characteristics, uh, combustion characteristics that enable and deliver uh, performance for ultra-low NOx um, that will meet or beat uh, the most aggressive standards that are being considered today, um, while at the same time delivering significant improvement in efficiency um, over existing incumbent technologies. There are a tremendous amount of adjacent opportunities as well as it relates to power density, engine downsizing, um, after treatment, and other system integration benefits as well. Uh, what we do, um, as a result of being an enabling technology company, um, we are not going to produce product. Our focus is to partner with key strategics in the industry 
uh, to develop, mature, validate, and hopefully commercialize um, this enabling technology. So you can see a, a collection of who our industry partners are today, and they range from uh, regulatory agencies, federal and state agencies, uh, people that share a common interest in the industry to advance this technology, as well as key enabling component um, technologies that we need to partner with, as well as vehicle integration people and powertrain integration people. So this is the, the most important part of our strategy is to be terrific at collaborating um, and building an ecosystem that allows us to develop the technology quickly, but more importantly, uh, to find quicker paths forward to market. Why we do it is simple. Um, I think in today's industry, particularly powertrain and transportation, um, un unprecedented disruptive times relative to the optionality that exists for technology that the industry has to not only evaluate, um, think through, develop, um, think about how it fits in their portfolio, but as importantly, uh, invest. And quite frankly, even in the most positive economic um, cycle, it's practically unaffordable to do so for everything. We think that this technology offers um, the most practical, affordable, fastest path um, to deliver the things that are most important to the industry, first and foremost, uh, efficiency improvement in CO2 reduction, um, as well as criteria emission reduction. Um, and of course, if in fact that is the case, and this is a faster path to production that's more practical, our opinion is that it uh, delivers a greater positive impact to the environment. So um, that is why we do it. Okay, moving on to the projects that we have in place today, starting on the lower right. We're actually in production with our partner Fairbanks Morse in the power generation business. Um, this technology enabled them to get from tier two to tier four compliance, greatly improve power density, and improve 15% in fuel efficiency from the prior technology. So uh, demonstrated in production, um, and we're looking forward to continued success with them there. Uh, the next one up is a collaborative agreement we have funded by the Department of Defense focused on combat vehicles. And this is a case where we have a unique value proposition that helps solve a problem for the Army. Um, and we have a strategic engagement with Cummins as uh, one of the largest um, engine manufacturers in the world to help us integrate the technology. Further up is a program that we have going with uh, uh, CARB and air quality management districts in Southern California, uh, focused on the heavy duty commercial vehicle business. This is intended to be a demonstration to prove that the technology can hit uh, the 0.02 ultra low NOx standard that's being contemplated, while at the same time delivering efficiency improvement. And so we're in the fairly early stages of this program right now, looking for a demonstration next year, and hopefully a commercialization uh, soon to follow. Uh, the next one is a medium duty commercial vehicle uh, project that we have that's actually outside the United States. Um, similar focus in terms of proving and demonstrating uh, fuel efficiency in ultra low NOx environments. The next two are um, kind of the biggest and most important one we have, and it happens to be the collaboration with ARPA-E. These have been fantastic product, uh, projects for us uh, because it's enabled us to bring in strategic partners to help us advance. So the first one is a 2.7 liter um, project aimed at the pickup truck market in North America. Um, and we're, we're looking forward to uh, being able to continue our collaboration on this platform. And then the third is the opportunity to solve a couple problems for the industry. One is to decouple the mechanical connection between two independent uh, crankshafts, while at the same time figuring out a way to electronically optimize um, what will be an infinitely variable combustion model. Um, so some terrific discovery taking place here, which I'm sure will find a home in the industry. Um, last, I just wanted to kind of place us on the adoption cycle or the uh, continuum of uh, maturing and scaling the technology. We are clearly on the left side of this chart, uh, working our way very aggressively to the right. And a big part of the theme of what we want to collectively talk to you about today is the challenge that we have in the middle. Um, I don't think we're unique in the fact that it's a very long adoption cycle, and we happen to be an incredibly capital intensive uh, market. Um, uh, so switching costs are very high. Um, and so this, this creates a um, significant challenge as we move um, from left to right in terms of engaging strategics, but also funding this uh, this journey or valley or, or mountain as we call it. So um, I hope this provides some helpful background and context as we head into the discussion. And um, I appreciate being able to be part of this. Thank you. Thanks, David. So we're going to do some back and forth Q&A here. And I hope the panelists will jump in on this too. But let me start off with a question and ask you to really spell out for us. Um, 
each of your companies is now in a scaling up kind of phase. Lots of companies never get there, or when they hit that stage, they run into huge difficulty. You guys have found ways to kind of navigate through this. Could you tell us what the, the kind of most, in your mind, the kind of most critical ways that you found to, uh, to get into this scale up kind of stage? Gene? Sure, yeah, I can start. I think um, the reason a lot of companies never get there is you, you have to start with that in mind from the beginning. You have to start with the end in mind. So you have to design a technology that it will ultimately be scalable. And if you don't do that, then it's not, you know, you, the investors will somewhere along the way fall off because they'll realize that, you know, there isn't really a path to scalability. So I think, um, you know, for us that meant from day one, commodity precursors, bulk manufacturing techniques, you know, some of what... Um, he talked about was, you know, using outsource manufacturing. So I think you have to find ways with sort of the end in mind. Layla? Yeah, and I'd like to add, definitely uh, you have to figure out how you're going to scale. You can't expect that there's going to be a world that grows a around your idea. Um, and then I'll also say you have to be solving the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. You have to be solving pain points that the industry mm -hmm. actually has uh, because uh, other otherwise there's no reason for you to move forward. Um, and you can't just be solving a, a small problem with a really cool technology. It's better to solve the biggest problem with maybe a less cool technology um, that can actually get to market. Okay. Yeah, so for us, you know, we've been at this for over a decade now. And so um, the three practical things that have been most important to us to kind of make it to where we are today is number one, we've had very patient and very aligned investors. Um, kind of a core investment group that understands that they're in it for the long term for the purpose. And, and that's... Uh, we're very fortunate to have that. I think the second thing is we've been able to figure out a way to leverage federal and state agency project and funding um, to get to the six projects that I identified there. And I think without that, you know, it would be very difficult to, to, to start. The third thing is we've figured out a way, as I said, in that, that middle ground to find strategics that have a common interest in seeing this succeed, um, to figure out a way to provide in-kind contribution, cash, and or both to surround these projects so that you can advance the technology in general. So those are the three kind of practical things that we've done to um, get through the years. Right. Uh, thus, so, thus I mean, far. each of you, each of you found a niche, right, that, that really helped you scale up. Um, each of you found ways to avoid, you know, a direct confrontation with massive incumbents, but instead to kind of tie up with them and work with them in a way. Um, and in effect, to solve, it, it was by solving problems for the sectors that you're in. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little more about that story. Why is, how did you come up with the technologies that are going to actually help the incumbents? And how did you, how did you make that sale to them as you begun the scale-up process? Who wants to jump in? I can start this time. Layla? Uh, so we've really started the, the massive scaling up in the last year. And as I mentioned, we have three major value propositions. Uh, one is that we have much better land utilization. Um, another is that we install two to three times as fast. And the third is that we have lower maintenance costs and lower maintenance overall. What's interesting is that only one of those can be proven without someone installing you first. So that even though customers said, OK, if all of things that these things are true, that's amazing. But how do I know I can believe you? Um, what they could do is they could look at the, our topography uh, value, and without having installed this at all, they could do their own assessment. One customer came to us and they said, did you know that if we use you instead of this other competitor, um, we save a lot for land grading? And it wasn't even that crazy a site. Um, and they said, basically, with this other competitor, it'll cost $11 million for us to take care of the land grading. With you, it'll take $200,000. And so those kind of things were things that people could see up front, and th that was enough to kind of get us in the door. And we expect as we have uh, more time deployed, those other values will start to come in and be the reason that people want us. David? For us, I think, um, you know, thinking about niche as a theme, there's a couple things. One, I think um, the point on not competing and collaborating with your ultimate customers, I think, is important. So it's important to start with that narrative first and foremost. And there's a tendency to try to compete and sell your technology on its own merits as opposed to it solving a larger problem. So your point on solving a larger problem I think is really important. For our particular um, industry, it's you know, hugely capital intensive um, with a lot of built up infrastructure that's been there for a long time. So as I mentioned, the switching costs are huge. 
Uh, so if you think about a niche, um, finding a way to either align with a customer on something that they're doing that's new, uh, maybe something that they were going to invest in anyway. Um, so you're not trying to substitute, you're trying to partner with them on something that they're doing that's uh, um, a replacement of their own, but it's still a new investment. And then the third is, can you figure out a way to get into any kind of adjacent markets? And for us, I think hybrid's a good example of that. It's not a direct substitution of a traditional internal combustion engine, um, but it's a way to partner with an ultimate customer to come up with a new solution that we will be part of. Um, so I think that's a, you know, a good focus. I would say the third thing is, um, in terms of niche, that covers both kind of funding, business model, and market, is what we're doing with the Department of Defense for combat vehicles. The funding model and how that works with Department of Defense works very well for us because it's, it's kind of cradle to grave support through technology evaluation, technology development, manufacturability, and then to production. And the program and the investment and the funding stays all the way through, which is ideal. I mean, that, that's a, it's, a, it's kind of a perfect model um, for us. And at least as it relates to combat vehicles, we found a way to offer unique value that they couldn't get anywhere else. So the combination of having a good support model that carries you through the life cycle and having unique value, mm -hmm. um, it's a, that's a perfect example of a niche. I wish there were more of them. <laughs> Gene, how about your anodes and lithium ion batteries? How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, for us, we, we've essentially looked at the whole value chain and, and looked for where you can create leverage, where you take something that's very small, a very small part of the system in terms of cost or, or, or weight or whatever, and, and it creates makes the whole system better. So um, you know, the anode material in a battery is, is sort of less than 5% of the cost, but by replacing it with something much better, we make the whole battery 20% better. And we're actually not making the battery 20% better, we make your car 20% better. So we're sort of taking something really small and leveraging it up to the vehicle. And then when we go to sell to the customer, we don't just go to the battery maker and say, hey, you can make the best battery in the world. We go to their customers and say, how would you like to be the only ones, you know, Daimler, BMW, who are two partners, to, to have the best battery in the world? And they help pull that through. So looking at where the, who, where the value is, and you want to pick something that's, that's small enough that you can tackle it, because it's still going to be really, really hard, but creates value at sort of that, that end piece. And so for, that's generally been our, our approach, but along the lines of talking about n niches, we think about um, you know, our product uh, from the beginning, the idea was we can go into consumer devices before we go into cars. And it's really important because before you can produce enough product for a million cars, you'll produce enough product for one car. And one car is not, you can't sell that, but one car is the equivalent of 10,000 cell phones. You can't quite sell that either, but it's the equivalent of 100,000 small smartwatches and maybe even 200,000 wireless earbuds. And so it's the same amount of product for us can end up in a lot more devices, creating a lot more value for the end consumer. And so we think about sort of reverse engineering that. Where can we use the least amount of what we make to create the most value? And then we use that end customer to pull us through. So I think for all of you then, finding the niche that doesn't declare war on your potential <laughs> customers but helps them has been a very key part of, of your scale-up process. So let me ask you a question. RPE requires US production for the results from its research. And all of you, and for all of you, RPE obviously played a very significant uh, role in earlier stages. How is US manufacturing working for you, right? Does it make good economic sense to you? Who wants to take that one on? I'll go ahead and start. Um, you know, I think the general answer is yes. Um, you know, most of the leading global companies in our space participate and are, uh, drive a lot of their technology leadership through the U.S. markets, um, so that's good. I think there's a solid infrastructure of support from regulators, agencies, et cetera, so there is an ecosystem to advance these things. Um, and, you know, as I said, most of them are global players, so North America, U.S. can be a, um, a global launching pad, so it, it's not prohibitive. I think that you know the other side of it is other markets can be more attractive. So if you look at India or other places, uh, more willing to take risk, uh, easier access to capital, and willingness to move faster. So those are three attractive things that would say I want to go there. Uh, but in those markets, they have their own challenges as well in terms of sustained economic value over time, just given how relationships form, how businesses are done, and the structure of of, of how things happen, along with some other um, issues. So. You know, I don't, I don't think it's prohibitive, um, and, and again, most of our focus, as I talked about going around that wheel of projects that we have, are actually U.S.-based. Got it. Layla? Yeah, 
I mean, I'll say that uh, we do have a manufacturing clause in our contracts, but that is not at all the reason that we are manufacturing in the U.S., and I think it's the wrong reason to manufacture in the U.S. We actually did an assessment of how much it would cost to manufacture in China versus the U.S., and the U.S. was substantially cheaper. And that was because we were using automation and high-volume processes. We had decided from the beginning we were going to do that. We weren't going to just decide the way we're going to build this is by taking advantage of low-cost labor. We're going to do this based on existing infrastructure. Um, and and you know, not to, to parrot what I just said in my talk, but, but what, what was so fantastic about that is that these manufacturers in the U.S., if you can leverage them, they're some of the best in the world. That means you can get something that is going to work, that's going to be very high quality, it's going to get there faster, um, and it's going to be a better thing for the grid overall. Jane, thoughts? Yeah, yeah, for us, it's, you know, we're developing such a new technology that um, uh, combines a lot of different process steps from different industries. Uh, and so for us, the, the decision was we actually built our first production line at headquarters. We didn't even go to sort of a lower cost part of the, the US. And that was so that our engineers could walk out in the back, fix the problem right there within hours, uh, troubleshoot, learn. So the learning cycle is, is also really important. Um, you know, for us, it's as we look at the assessment, the great thing is our cost of product ultimately trends to, to cost of energy. And the US has very low cost of energy. And so if you're, if you're making something that's made in massive volumes, you need automation and you need low cost of energy. And so the US can be quite beneficial. I think as we get into the very long run, you start to think about wherever cars are produced, batteries will be made, and wherever batteries are made, they're going to want their supply chain. But that's so far in the future that, you know, for the next decade, we can easily scale out in the U.S. Yeah, so some interesting lessons here, I think. I mean, Layla, in your case, just shifting right into advanced manufacturing, right, rather than more traditional manufacturing became a significant enabler. And I think from both of you, Gene and David, the, the need for proximity between the know-how and the manufacturing process right. and the refinements that you've got to make in your product line as you move into production design, that proximity turns out to be important. Is that a fair summary? It is. You know, again, I will say that there is a desire, um, motivation, et cetera, to go faster right, and to get more capital. And so, uh, again, there is a draw to go do that uh, potentially um, somewhere else. So, you know, in my opinion, collectively as an industry for us, we have to figure out a way to explore and innovate faster, but more importantly, uh, get to adoption faster if we're going to compete. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's yeah. an important thing. Let me, let me push you all. I mean, we've come up with a number of kind of lessons here about niches, about the close association with the production process itself um, that have been important to your scale up. Um, if you had two or three lessons for the startups that are represented in this audience, you know, what would those lessons be uh, for them on scale up and moving into production? I mean, David, I want to draw on a point you made earlier. Uh, and it's a very traditional route. You know, look to the Defense Department. Right? They make a lot of stuff and they buy a lot of stuff. So traditionally, that has been a very standard scale-up route for many, many U.S. Right. tech companies. Uh, that's an intriguing one. But what are some of the other lessons? And maybe start with you, David, and, and build on that. Well, I think uh, uh, I'm personally still in the learning uh, stage, having been there for six months. But obviously, I have some good insight into the history of the company. So these, and we're still learning lessons as we go here. So these might be watchouts or insights as opposed to lessons learned. Maybe I'll be invited back in a couple of years and I'll share some lessons. Um, but a couple of the watchouts, I think, you know, as you think about what I shared with you, um, is being deliberate about focus versus creating more pathways to market. Um, we've decided to create more pathways to market, which obviously increase your ability um, to get adoption success, but if and when it happens and the technology is advanced, you can monetize and you can go faster if you have more pathways. The difficult thing is if you have a long adoption cycle, it's incredibly costly um, and resource intensive to be able to carry six projects simultaneously. Um, and time will tell whether or not that uh, plays out, uh, you know, for us. We feel good about the progress that we're making on the projects, but this notion of focus versus creating more pathways, you know, I think is a good one. The second thing I would say is um, figure out a way to bring your strategics in as early as possible into the process. And for us, strategics means either the engine manufacturers or the vehicle manufacturers. 
um, because the tendency is to focus on your core technology and your problem to solve that you think offers the most value. But the importance of solving the customer's problem and the industry's problem is so important. And unless you bring the strategics into that process early, you'll end up iterating on all the other critical system requirements. Um, and that iteration costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And so um, we are, we're moving very much in that direction and finding how valuable that is to really understand what the market and customer needs are from their perspective, not ours. Great. So aside from the DOD lesson, you know, it's an important point about pathways that, in other words, one pathway breaks down and fails. You've got a whole different set of routes that you can essentially call on to actually get into, into markets and cl staying close to the strategics and it's probably another good lesson. Layla, how about some lessons from your experience for these companies out there? Yeah, I mean, I think at the stage we're at now, um, I think we're at a stage where the strategics are paying attention. Um, we are part of Macquarie Capital's venture studio, and they've been this incredible strategic partner as we're going to market. But earlier on, I think we were, uh, there were different ways we thought of uh, how we partner with, with uh, bigger entities than ourselves. Um, we actually have been in quite a few accelerators and incubators that are all uh, focused on energy companies, and, and that was really critical every step of the way because you're a small company, you're figuring out where to go next, um, getting more and more of these um, external parties who are invested in you being successful is extremely important. And then the other piece that I think, um, a piece of advice I would give is, even though um, so many of you are building just these incredible inventions and technologies, um, the energy industry is one that has been around for a long time and it exists with collaboration and, co and cooperation. And going in with as much humility as possible has been an important step for us. Always asking, what is your problem? Not telling them what, it, what we have for you, but what can we do to help the industry be better? And that humility, I think, is part of why we've been able to develop something that is really what the industry needs. Gene. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a couple of things that worked well and a couple of things that are really lessons learned. Well, that's so good. The things that worked well. Let's get them both on the table. Yeah, the things that worked well for us was starting with the end in mind. We really did constrain our scientists and engineers eight years ago to use only bulk commodity precursors um, and, and bulk manufacturing techniques, and that's allowed scaling to technically be feasible. Um, and, and the other bit that, that we did well, I'll, I'll echo um, what Lila said earlier, is, is start with the hardest problem because the other thing that happens is you get more market pull, so that helps you get investment, that helps people uh, you know, really want what you're doing to come to market. The things we could have done better and I would do a little bit differently is um, a little more measure twice, cut once. Uh, these programs and scaling up take a really long time, and even if you sort of think you're going to do it quickly, it's going to take you a lot longer than you think. And so, um, you know, what you really want to do is make every one of those scale-up steps count. So I sort of say go, take fewer, bigger steps. Like, go even bigger than you think in the next step, because it's going to take you a long time no matter what. So you might as well sort of go big. That's something we're trying to internalize now as we think about our next stage. Um, and then the other bit, that we didn't do as well as we could have is, is sort of find those external partners early, uh, not even partners, but just go understand the landscape of what's out there in the world and what subsystems and tools and pieces you can use and borrow from different industries um, because it's really not obvious. And, and especially if you're, if you have a relatively young team, you don't necessarily know what's out there in the world. And, you know, I think you can find partners that'll surprise you in what they can do and, and they can make your scale up a lot easier. So. So some terrific additional lessons here, I think. Uh, we're close to the end of our time. Uh, let me throw out sort of a kind of a larger closing question. You know, our system really lacks mechanisms to help on this scale up towards production, right? We just don't have a lot in our system. There's not a lot of bridges out there. There's not a lot of ways to scale up that amount of death. Are there some bridges? that you all think that we need, that we could do on the policy side that might really help companies like yours? I mean, we know, for example, that RPE has just issued a new RFI about what it could do on this problem because its existing authorizing legislation actually enables it to dive into this kind of developmental state. So it's thinking about it. Um, if you've got advice for RPE on what to do about scale-up, 
What's, what is one thought that you've got to help us close this out? Gene, let me start with you. Yeah, I, I think there's not a lot in terms of support between sort of the huge DOE loan guarantees one can go get to sell, help scale up and sort of where RPE falls off. So finding something in the middle um, that can help build a first plant, a first production line uh, that sort of would, would follow on when the technology works would be, would be hugely helpful. Um, so either creating some funding mechanism for some subset of technologies for that, um, you know, or, or finding more connections into high value markets that are early, whether it's in, you know, the U.S. government and other places. So creating pull, either pull or push in mm -hmm. some way, but right between kind of those, you know, there's the very large loan guarantees and there's sort of the grants. There's sort of the middle is a little bit thin. Right. Layla. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting is um, this is hardware, but it's not consumer hardware. This isn't something that someone's going to throw away in a year. We're building things that are bank finance that need to be out and working in harsh environments for 30 years. This is more like putting something into space than it is like putting an iPhone out there. And I think that the stage that's missing is realizing that infrastructure requires years of hardware hardening and laying the foundation for bankability. And I think this pilot program could be about that, depending on which direction it goes in. I mean, there's bankability partners like DNV um, and uh, Black and & Veatch, but they really serve the banks. And what we need is to really partner these companies with partnerships that can understand what does it take to make, to make your technology, not a technology product, but a bankability product, because that's the only way this is going to scale. David, closing thought. I think uh, both of those apply and both well said. Um, the only thing I would add is, as you think about project structure and policy and philosophy, it's back to my notion on bringing the strategics in much earlier. And so I would just encourage to get uh, creative and figure out a way to get comfortable um, with the fact that that is not subsidizing commercialization. It's actually accelerating and improving the quality of the technology development and validation. Um, and I think that would go a long way towards eliminating this iteration um, and lengthening this uh, kind of long cycle that we're all struggling with today. Great. Thank you all very much. Let's thank our panel. Thank you.